Before I begin, I'd like to just uh, read from Revelation 22 um, uh, and, and look at this passage. It says, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. That is the hope we look forward to. That is the promise of God's word. That is the privilege of living in the power of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Father, as we begin 2017, we thank you for all that you do. We thank you for your amazing grace and your amazing love. We thank you that you provide for us at every opportunity and that you care for us deeply. Lord, fill us with your spirit. Teach us your word. Help us to worship. And Lord, teach us to pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we are upon a new year, 2017. They usually say the old is gone, the new has come. But really, in reality, isn't it just another day? (laughs) Well, how do you prepare for the new year? What are some things and traditions that you do um, to prepare for the new year? Well, for example, here's a few things that take place around the world. In Siberia, it is tradition to dive into a frozen lake while holding a tree trunk, which is placed underneath the ice. We'll kind of get the logistics of that, but it is traditional festival from Burma. People splash water on one another to start the new year with a purified soul. Armenian mothers, nothing to do with the Calvinists, Armenian mothers bake special bread which they need with good luck and good wishes in the philippines homeowners open all their doors and windows on new year's eve in order to allow negative energy to leave and good energy to enter kind of cold if we did that here spanish tradition holds that eating 12 grapes just before the clock chimes midnight will bring good fortune for all 12 months of the upcoming year i think we drink that here One New Year's custom in Russia is to write a wish for the upcoming year on a piece of paper, then to burn the paper and place the ashes in a glass of champagne, which needs to be consumed right before the New Year is wrong, and for the wish to come true. Residents in Johannesburg, South Africa, throw old appliances and furniture out the window, representing the old adage, out with the old and in with the new. That's kind of expensive tradition. Brazilians wear white clothing, a custom meant to bring good luck for the upcoming year. This is often accompanied by a trip to the beach to throw flowers in the sea while making a wish. Well, what do we do in America to ring in the new year? Typically, an American tradition on New Year's is to make resolutions, right? Or several resolutions stating, I will resolve to do this or not to do that. Or I resolve to losing weight getting fit, reading more books, earn more money, give more money, be kinder, nicer, etc., etc., etc. Well, normally resolutions are broken by January 5th. Maybe you get it through January. Maybe you make it through March. Sometimes some people make it all the way through. Well, what resolution will you make this year or will you? I pray that when we look at our lives and the patterns we develop, we don't seek the news or the opinion pieces or other voices, but rather we inquire of the Lord, what will you have me do? I pray we resolve to seek God in every decision we make. We resolve to listen to him. I pray we're not like Joshua in Joshua 9 when a group of Gibeonites dressed up in worn out clothes carry moldy bread, asking to make a treaty with Joshua And there's a rather sad phrase in this passage that says the men of Israel sampled their provisions but did not inquire of the Lord. They made a treaty without inquiring of the Lord. Let us be careful to inquire of the Lord in all that we do. Let us seek him. Let that be our resolution, to inquire of him. Well, today I want to talk about the issue of generosity as a fundamental characteristic of the Christ-like nature. Generosity, which begins with knowing who God is 
and surrendering our very selves to him. You know, when Jesus saw Peter, Andrew, James, and John casting their nets, working as fishermen, he said, come, follow me. He did not expect them to stay fishing, but to follow. He said, give up everything. You are to be exclusively mine. Now, according to uh, David Platt in his book, Radical, he says, ultimately, Jesus was calling them to abandon themselves. They were leaving certainty for uncertainty, safety for danger, self-preservation for self-denunciation. In a world that prizes promoting oneself, they were following a teacher who told them to crucify themselves. And history tells us the result. Almost all of them would lose their lives because they responded to his invitation. To be exclusively and totally followers of Christ, we must risk everything. You must risk everything for Christ as Lord, and he is worthy that we risk everything. So I challenge you today, give Christ everything. Give Christ everything. Give him your whole life. Give him your will, your desires, your heart, and your vision. Let the grace of Christ wash over you and flow through you. Let the words and the acts of Christ flow through you. Each day, pray, asking God to reveal himself through you. Ask God each day, saying, Lord, teach me something new about you. Teach me who you are. Change something within me. Transform me to look more and more like you, because Christ is worthy. Give him everything. You know, in the book of 2 Corinthians, Paul is encouraging the Corinthian church to fulfill its intention in supplying an offering for the Jerusalem church. The Jerusalem church has uh, suffered some kind of setback. There have been some financial strains in the community. There had been a famine uh, a few years back. The people were hurting. And also what's going on in Jerusalem is that there's division between the Jerusalem church and the churches that Paul has been planting throughout the, the Mediterranean world. And as he's been planting these churches, these, these churches are mostly Gentile churches. And the Jerusalem church is mostly Jewish churches. Or the Jewish church. And so there's tension and there's conflict and and there's angst between what's going on there. And Paul, he wants to say, I want unity. I want I want the conflict to go away. I want holiness to be felt. I want Christ to be known. And so I want this church, these churches to take an offering. And I want this offering to be an act of generosity to show that we're unified with each other. And so that's what he's doing. Well, as we really know that um, as we read Corinthians and the, the life of Paul, this is there's actually four letters that Paul wrote that we know of to the Corinthian churches. We have two of them. Um, in this letter, in Second Corinthians, what had happened, he was a, they really loved Paul. He came in there. He to, taught them the gospel. But over time, as he left to go to other cities to plant churches and to teach, Other teachers came in and they began to say about Paul, well, you know, Paul's not that great of a guy. He's a poor speaker. He's ugly. I don't know if they said that. But they kind of looked at him and they tried to take away their attention from Paul and say, don't listen to him. And so this letter in 2 Corinthians is sort of a a really, he comes harsh on him, you know. He he comes after him and says, you know, and, but the way he represents himself in this letter is rather interesting because he says, what are you doing? What are the characteristics of a, of a godly uh, and a good teacher uh, as opposed to a false teacher? You know, they, they didn't have the New Testament at the time where they could look at and say, well, according to the New Testament, you know, <laughs> it wasn't there. And so what, would they, what was the thing that Paul wanted to show the Corinthian church that he was a godly teacher, a true teacher as opposed to a false teacher? Okay. And, and he would say, And so in 2 Corinthians 11, he starts out saying, well, look at what I've done. I've gone, I've been in danger of this. I've been in danger of this. I've been persecuted. I've been beaten. I've been this and gone through that. And then finally he says, you know what? I am weak. And when I'm weak, Christ is strong. He shows that the authority rests not in the promotion of him, but in his weakness. That I'm nothing. And Christ is everything. And so he demonstrates that the godly teacher is someone who doesn't promote me, but promotes Christ. You know, in um, in Second Corinthians two, he says, for we are to God the aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. 
To the one we are the smell of death, to the other the fragrance of life. And who is equal to such a task? Unlike so many, we do not peddle the word of God for a profit. On the contrary, in Christ we speak before God with sincerity, like men sent from God. He also says, we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus is Lord and ourselves as servants for Jesus' sake. And he also warned the church saying, but I'm afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Now, I want you to notice what he's doing here, that Paul is constantly saying, look to Christ. Don't take your don't take your eyes off of Christ. Always keep your eyes on Christ because you and I are susceptible to so many things that we can easily be led astray in this world. We can be easily led astray. Maybe you don't like hearing that, but that is the truth. We can be easily led astray from Christ. Our own mind and hearts can take us away from God. They betray us. Our eyes stray. Our hearts yearn for other things. Our lives pursue temporal riches. Keep your eyes on Christ, he's saying. And give him everything. And the reason we give him everything, number one, God owns it all. Let's take a look at 2 Corinthians 9. Start with verse 6. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each man should give what he's decided in his own heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, he has scattered abroad his gifts to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. When you keep your eyes on God, you realize he owns it all and he is Lord of all. It reminds me of this story because this man wanted to uh, help this poor carpenter and his family. This certain rich man decided that he would hire him to build a house on a beautiful hillside. And the poor man accepted the job, and as the story is told, plans for the house were made, and construction got underway. Not long into the project, the rich man was called away for biz, uh, um, business and would be gone for a considerable length of time. The carpenter reasoned that while his boss was away, he would make a little extra money by choosing inferior grade material and put it in inconspicuous places. Nobody would know. The house, of course, would be less sturdy, but none would be the wiser. So he went and he bought this inferior grade material and he would start to put it in places that nobody, uh, only he would know. Well, at last, the rich man returned to find that the work had been completed. The carpenter presented the house, and the rich man thanked him for his work. Then, in an unexpected act of generosity, the rich man presented both the deed and the key to the house to the carpenter, saying, I'm giving this house to you and your family. Well, the joy of receiving such an unexpected gift was dampened by the realization that he had actually robbed himself. He had robbed himself, and who... Uh, would now have to live in the house that he had cut corners to build. Everything we have is because of God anyway, isn't it? What kind of life are you building? You reap what you sow. This is what we read in that whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly. It's a matter of generosity and lordship. Who is the Lord of your life? Paul was asking the Corinthians, what kind of life, what kind of house are they building? Give everything to him. Give everything to Christ. Number one, you are a steward. When you realize that God owns it all, it makes you a steward. When you realize God owns it all. When you see all that you are and all that you have as God's and you realize that you're accountable to him. And, and whatever God wants, you desire to do what he wants. If you believe that I own it all, then you will treat it as if you own it all. And you will not see God as Lord. If you know that God owns it all, then, I realize, then you realize this, that everything I have is because of him. And everything that I received came from him. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you receive from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. You don't belong to yourself. You belong to God. You were bought at a price, and it was a steep price. 
I'm reminded of what Jeremy Rifkin wrote in a book called Algony, who says, we are our own masters. And this is what he wrote. We, are no, we no longer feel ourselves to be guests in someone else's home and therefore obliged to make our behavior conform with a set of pre-existing cosmic rules. It is our creation now. We make the rules. We establish the parameters of reality. We create the world. And because we do, we no longer feel beholden to outside forces. We no longer have to justify our behavior, for we are now the architects of the universe. We are responsible to nothing outside ourselves, for we are the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Boy, is that prideful or what? That is the attitude that we live in today. Our lives are not our own. We belong to God. He is our creator. In Proverbs 16, 9, we read, In his heart a man plans his course, but the Lord determines his steps. And in Jeremiah, we, read, we hear these words, I know, O Lord, that a man's life is not his own. It is not for man to direct his steps. We are stewards, and we're called by God to administer what he owns and to be stewards of what he has given to us. When Paul was talking to the Corinthians, he wanted them to inspire. He wanted to inspire them to give. He wanted them to give to this offering so he could, they could show the unity that we have with these Jewish and Gentile churches to show this act of generosity. And he wasn't worried about what they gave just as much as that they did give. It wasn't the amount that mattered to him. It was the act of giving that mattered. He wanted the Corinthian church to be willingly and gladly to give, not through coercion or compulsion. He knew that if they were inspired to give, they would give. And who inspired them? Christ. Christ is our inspiration. He is our desire. He is our willingness to give. When we fall before God, we say, God, have it all. Have my heart, my eyes, my hands, my feet, everything I own. Have it all have my whole life, then giving becomes a joy because you simply are doing what God desires. Paul said, give what he has decided and not reluctantly, for God loves a cheerful giver. What have you decided to give when you realize God owns it all and you're a steward? Then deciding to give is a matter of obedience and hearing from God. God, how much am I to give? How much money, how much of my time, how much of my talents, my giftedness, whatever you've given me, what can I give back? Our maturity is demonstrated many ways, and Paul is showing the Corinthians how maturity is understood. When you are cheerful, regardless of the amount you give, a it is a demonstration of your immaturity. Number two, there is joy in love. God is a cheerful giver. Do you know that? Because he commands us to be cheerful givers. That's because God is a cheerful giver. He gladly and cheerfully and wonderfully gives. The character of God is revealed in what he has done and how he has given. When you give joyfully and cheerfully, you act like God. You are a demonstration of God's character. When we look at God in scripture, we use superlatives like all-knowing, all-powerful, ever-present, eternal, wonderful, overwhelming, amazing, whatever other superlative names that we give and titles. He is beyond, yet he's near. He is holy, loving, and beautiful. Yet when you think of God and the superlative names we use, what could he possibly want? What could poss God possibly want? What could be the ultimate and complete expression of power that God is? God does not gain by getting. He already is all that he is. <laughs> There's nothing more he needs to be by taking. If, if Instead, he gives. Giving is what love does. Love is the expression and revelation of holiness. What could God possibly gain with all that he is and all that he knows and the power he uses? He doesn't need to take anything. He doesn't need to have anything. So his expression of power is not by taking, but by giving, by loving. That is, Paul, that is why when Paul wrote, he who sows sparingly will reap sparingly, is that, is that it is to sow sparingly is not Christ-like. The God who gives wants his people to be a people who give because God abundantly gives through us, through people. 
God cheerfully gives as we cheerfully know what God has given to us. We cheerfully give. You know, it's interesting. Ron Blue, who's a financial guy, uh, he says that if every person in the church were on welfare and gave 10%, we'd have more money than we need. (laughs) Paul continues in this passage by saying that God is able to make all grace abound to you. As you act like God, you will abound in every good work. When you see the world, the people in this world, as God sees them, you will give, you will endure, you will show Christ, you will do all that you can to make Christ available. You know, my life, my, my life will be a lifestyle of good as God gives and acts through me. If you look at 9, 9, and 10 again, it says, As it is written, he who is scattered abroad uh, his gifts to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You see that giving is linked to righteousness. That compassion is connected to doing what you can to alleviate suffering. In Isaiah 1, the prophet wrote, Learn to do right, seek justice, encourage the oppressed, defend the cause of the fatherless, plead the case of the widow. In Amos 2, God warned, saying this, This is what the, the Lord says, For three sins of Israel, even for four, I will not turn back my wrath. They sell the righteous for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. They trample on the heads of the poor as upon the dust of the ground. And deny justice to the oppressed. Father and son use the same girl and so profane my holy name. Do you see in Amos 2 an act of generous people? Do you see generosity portrayed in Acts chapter 2 there with those sins? No. You see people taking, immorality taking, immorality destroying lives. There's no generosity or compassion in that. Righteousness is demonstrated by generosity. So let's give everything we have to Christ. Take it all, Lord. As we sung earlier today, I surrender all. Number two, God is our provider. Let's look at verse 11. You will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Jeff Ferreira, I believe who lives in Illinois, was reconciling his checkbook and called his bank to get his current balance. So he called the bank and he asked them what my, or it went through this electronic voice and the electronic voice says, your primary checking account has a balance of $924,844,204.32. Where'd that come from? No, I'm just kidding. Well, Jeff was one of 826 customers who were almost billionaires for a day because of the biggest error in history of the U.S. banking. The goof amounted to almost $764 billion, more than six times the total assets of the bank corporation. Uh, Jeff's friends told him, say, hey, take the money, take it to Cayman Islands and run for your life, you know. <laughs> but like the others, he simply reported the error to the bank and it was a computer programming glitch and that things were taken care of. Well, what would we have done? What would you have done? Of course, the tempting part would be take it and run, right? It would be tempting to do. If you belong to God and God owns it all, you speak the truth. Give everything, even the truth, when at times you want to lie. In 1996, the auction of the Jackie Kennedy Onassis estate was expected to bring in a total of $5 million. But the first night was 4.5. And the worn footstool went for 33000 and a silver tape measure sold for almost 50000 The night's highest price was a walnut tobacco humidor that belonged to President Kennedy. It sold for 575000 And many items auctions were common. And they be, why were, these were common things. But why were they so valuable? Because of who it belonged to. You are not common. You belong to God. You've been bought with a price. God has graced you with his presence. You are valuable valuable because God has touched you. He has revealed himself to you. He has filled you with his spirit. He has given you Christ. And when you realize that you're a steward, you give. And when you realize God owns it all, you worship. When you realize that God lavishes upon you, you wait on him. Number one, God will take care of you. 
In 9 verse 11, we see it says, you will be made rich in every way. God will bless you. And a lot of times when you think rich, well, I think of millions and billions of dollars myself, you know. I think when he says you will be rich, you will be taken care of. You will be given what you need. You will be made rich so that you can be generous with what God has given you. It's an act of generosity. Our tendency and our inclination is to keep we ha- what we have because we fear the future. And let me tell you, the future can be quite scary because you don't know what might happen today, six months to a year. If what I have now is given away, then in the future I'll suffer because I'll lose my job or something bad will happen. So I better keep what I have. I better hoard what I have. It is a tendency within us to self to be self preservation and and self-preservation can easily turn into selfishness. It's easy because to turn away from others and say, well, I got to keep what I have. But do we live by faith or do we live by sight? If God is taking care of us today, can he not take care of us tomorrow? He knows we're anxious about tomorrow. He knows that there are difficulties. He knows there are lost jobs, unexpected medical bills, or your car breaks down or things happen. He knows in first Peter five, this is what God says. Cast your cares on God. And Paul wrote, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. In prayer, seek out God. God provides. God cares for you. Even the tiniest things that we think are insufficient and mundane. God cares. When we live knowing God takes care of us is that we do not have to live in the fear of the future. We do not have to worry about tomorrow. We do not have to fret, but simply rest in his provisions, knowing, God, you got it. We can trust him knowing we have nothing to fear, as he says in 9.9, that he's making us rich so that we can be generous on every occasion. We have an agenda to demonstrate God's faithfulness by our generosity. God is asking us to lay our lives on the altar and die to self, die to fear, die to all these things, die to our own agenda, die to selfish desires, die to our own path. And when we do that, God raises us up and uses us for his good works and other people will worship and other people will be thankful because of how we lived our lives. Number two, our God, our giving exalts Christ. You know, as you look at the last part of this verse, And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Through us, your generosity. It demonstrates that this world so desperately needs. The Corinthian church lived in the city of Corinth. One of the most immoral places to live. A church, a place of holiness and righteousness, sitting in the midst of a sin-infested city. An Amos 2 sort of passage city. Okay? What did this city need? It needed Christ, generosity. A sin-infested city is not generous. All it does is it takes and takes and takes, and it takes life out of people. It robs people of life. It destroys their souls. A generous church stands counter to what man builds. All our towns, our cities, and all our achievement takes and robs us of life. God is the one who gives life. We are to stand counter to the selfish, destructive patterns of our humanistic filled attitudes. We are generous because we have given Christ everything. And it stands contrary to what man builds. You got to look at Revelation 18 and read through that. And you see this city that man has built, Babylon, as it's called. It's not a generous city. It's a city that takes and robs life, destroys. And then you see the city of God in Revelation 21. And you see a contrast, a very different city. It's interesting that when we are generous, we provide an opportunity for thanksgiving to take place. This is what we're about, giving people an opportunity to worship. Number three, God is worshiped. Let's look at verse 12. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of God's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the service by which you approved yourselves, 
Men will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them with everyone else. And in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. As I read these words, again, I'm reminded of the power of giving and the joy that it affords us. Our giving is a statement of faith, believing God provides and giving people an opportunity to get and see God, to worship him. In a city filled with immorality that demoralizes and cheapens human life, God, through his people, brings life. We bring Christ. Our giving, our tithing, our talents, our very lives, when given to God, is an expression of thanks to God while showing the world of what he's about and who he is. Number one, men will praise God. Now, in a city where where praise to God is rare, because Corinth would have been a place where praise to God was rare, This church is bringing praise to God. What this world needs is our unashamed testimony that Christ Jesus is Lord. We are not to shrink back from our faith, but without equivocation declare our love for God. Your generosity is an act of worship, and men will worship and praise God because of who we are in Christ. Don't let the news of the economy, the nature of humanistic thinking, cloud our faith to thinking you have to keep what you have. But instead, let the peace of God express itself through you declaring the majesty of God, knowing he is worthy of worship and he's capable of taking care of you. This church was not a wealthy church. It lived inside a city that was a very immoral city. In 1 Corinthians 1, we read, sort of get an idea of what this church was the type of people that lived in this, that went to this church. It says, do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexual offenders, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanders, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. That is who they were. This church was made up of people that were like that. This church was filled not with powerful or the elites or the nobles, but with the lost and the forgotten, the used and the abused. People who were just trying to survive. They had nothing, yet they gave. Their generosity caused men to praise God. Nothing in this city would cause men to praise God. Nothing. But this church afforded these people in this town to, uh, to praise God because of who they believed and, who, and what Christ had done. In this city of Evanston, as we look at the men and women in this town, as we see immoral lives happening, people hurting, dying, struggling, falling apart. Maybe they're sick with the disease. They have no money. They're dying because the immorality of the world is taking and robbing them of their lives. What are we to do as a people? Will our hearts break for them? As you go into the Smiths or Walmart or to other areas in this town and you see these people, let our hearts break for them and say, Lord, how can I give them Jesus today? What can I do to show them Christ today? What can I do to give them the name of Christ today? How can they know the love of Jesus today? Show me, God, because I don't know how. I hope our heart breaks as we look at our town, as we look at our state, as we look at our country and our world, and say, God, what can I do even now to give them Jesus? I challenge you, give everything to Christ. You know, a parable, a man was lost in the desert just dying for a drink of water. He stumbled upon an old shack, ramshackled, windowless, roofless, weather-beaten old shack. He looked about this place, and he found a little shade from the heat of the desert sun. And as he glanced around, he saw a pump about 15 feet away. It was an old, rusty water pump. He stumbled over to it, and he's dying of thirst. And he grabbed the handle, and he begins to pump, and nothing happens. Disappointed, he staggered back. He noticed off to the side an old jug. He looked at it, wiped away the dirt and dust, and read a message that said, you have to prime the pump with all the water in this jug, my friend. P.S., be sure to fill the jug again before you leave. Well, he popped the cork out of the jug, and sure enough, it was full of water. 
And suddenly he was faced with this decision. Do I drink this water or do I do what the, the note says and pour it on there and, and get clean, fresh water from the, from the well? Well, he studied the possibility of both options. What should he do? Pour it into the old pump? Take the chance? What should he do? So finally and reluctantly, he poured all the water into the pump. Then he grabbed the handle and he began to pump. Squeak, 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 nothing. And then a little bit began to dribble out. Then a small stream and finally it gushed. And to his relief, fresh, cool water poured out of the rusty pump and eagerly filled the jug, drank it all, ju- drank two jugs. He was so thirsty. And then he filled it a third time for the next traveler and he filled it to the top. He popped the cork back on and he added this little note. Believe me, it really works. You have to give it all away before you get anything back. Give Christ everything. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your Holy Spirit for your son, the Lord Jesus. And Lord, I pray that we will be a people who are generous for you are incredibly generous to us. May we be a people burdened by what you're burdened with and broken for what hurts your heart and that we will celebrate you. Thank you, Lord. Jesus' name.